Hi everyone, Ollie here. I am a final year medical student at the University of Warwick and welcome back to my interview prep series. Today we're going to be tackling a scenario based problem, quite a common one that comes up the drunk consultant or the drunk senior colleague. The station instructions are as follows You're a junior doctor shadowing a consultant surgeon in your local hospital while trying to gain some surgical experience. You've been instructed to go to the operating theatre first thing in the morning to get changed and scrub up. When you arrive, you notice the consultant take a swig from a flask in his locker and notice that he smells of alcohol. So what do you do? And as always, when faced with a scenario like this, we need to immediately home in on the problem. So the only really abnormal element to this preamble we were given is that the consultant smells faintly of alcohol, which he may or may not have consumed from the flask that we saw. Again, we obviously don't know that those two things are linked, but there is good reason to think that they are. And again, just keeping our thinking caps on, we can't assume, based on this, that the consultant is drunk, right? We don't know that. But we do know that this scenario is taking place in the morning, we've been told that, and morning drinking is not a normal activity for most people. It tends to be associated with abuse of alcohol, and therefore usually some sense of dependence rather than pleasure. No one drinks alcohol for pleasure first thing in the morning. But of course, the major thing that we need to be concerned about is that the consultant might be drunk, but specifically, why is that a problem? That's not a problem in and of itself. It's always useful to be really explicit with your reasoning and the problem is not just that they might be inebriated, but it's that their judgment and their precision, because they're a surgeon about to operate, might be impaired because of the alcohol. And so therefore they would pose a danger to any patient that they were operating on. It always comes back to patient safety. And even if they weren't drunk, if in fact they were hung over, this is still probably going to be the case and they absolutely should not be operating if they're not in the correct frame of mind to do so. The bottom line, again, our patients need to be kept safe. To quote from good medical practice, if you have concerns that a colleague may not be fit to practice, you must take appropriate steps without delay. Now just to quickly quote from good medical practice, the holy bible of good doctor behaviour, if you have concerns that a colleague may not be fit to practice, you must take appropriate steps without delay so that concerns are investigated and patients protected. I really wish the wording was the other way around. It should be patients protected first, I think. So when we're tackling these sorts of practical scenarios, it can be really helpful for an interviewer if we are able to spell out not just what we want to do, but why we want to do it and what we're likely to achieve in the real world. So with that in mind, the first port of call could simply be talking to the consultant, you know, away from everyone else, quietly, respectfully, to address your concerns. Fundamentally, what we're trying to do is gather information. Like I said, we can't make assumptions based on what we've seen, but we do have concerns. So the next logical thing to do would be investigate those concerns and ask the consultant what's up. And again, keeping everything private, confidential and quiet to minimize embarrassment to not just the consultant, who remember, we could be completely falsely accusing of being drunk or unsafe to operate, but to yourself as well. However, as I kind of hinted, it can be useful to illustrate that you have a more realistic view of how these scenarios might play out. It's not unreasonable to suggest or to think that the average consultant is not going to take much notice of a foundation doctor, particularly one that they don't know very well, and probably won't care what they think. So it may be appropriate to speak to someone more senior, either one of the nursing team or one of your senior colleagues, about the problem. Because patient safety is always the thing that everyone is ultimately concerned about, if you raise a question of safety or a concern to one of your colleagues, they're essentially obliged to take you seriously and investigate it properly because if something does go wrong further down the line and you raised it and they did nothing, that's coming back to them. We're halfway through the video now guys, if you would be so kind as to leave a like and hit that subscribe button for the channel, I'd really appreciate it. It really, really helps me out and helps me keep these videos free. It is also really important if we're going to escalate to choose the right person. In the same way that the consultant probably doesn't know you very well or care who you are, you should probably raise the issue with someone who the consultant is likely to take a bit more notice of or have more respect for. And because of that, it should probably be a member of their own team. So that might be the nurse in charge of running the ward or one of the senior registrars. And the other alternative, if you're a foundation doctor, would simply be speaking to your educational supervisor. But rest assured that in most cases, even if you're speaking to someone who does not feel that they're the right person, they should be able to redirect you. Escalations are taken really seriously. And at that point, things are probably out of your hands as a foundation doctor in terms of dealing with that scenario. Once patients are being protected in one form or another, either because you know the consultant 
is fit to operate, which is a perfect possibility at this point, or you know that the patients are not going to be operated on by that surgeon, there are some more things we can consider. Firstly, we could ask, is that consultant likely to drive home, for example? If they are thinking about driving home and you're coming up on the end of a shift, you could offer to drive them home. Uh, when you finish, remember that your patients need to continue to receive care, so you can't take them home yourself, or that would be an inappropriate thing to do. Or you might be able to suggest somewhere they could sleep, whether that's the on-call room or in the doctor's mess. Usually there's somewhere where they can nap for a few hours and sleep it off. We have to remember, of course, that consultants in the NHS are incredibly respected and highly trained professionals. UK doctors have some of the longest training in the medical world. They've spent many, many years working for the benefit of patients and for the NHS. We need to continue treating them with the same levels of compassion and respect as we always would, even if we feel that they've made a mistake. Everyone makes mistakes. And then the final thing to think about is documentation. Even if no patient harm actually occurred for whatever reason, this is still something that needs documenting because the fact that this doctor showed up to work drunk or hungover is a bit of a red flag. It's something that needs keeping an eye on. And that's purely because it demonstrates lack of insight. They were capable of ringing in and saying, you know what, I'm unfit to come to work. That causes problems, but it's a lot better than putting patients in harm's way and knowingly operating on someone when you're not fit to do so is, is just an unthinkable thing to try and do. Again, the thing to do will be speak to a member of the senior management team and work out that while this needs to stay confidential and quiet to minimise embarrassment to that doctor, it does need to be logged properly. And this has two benefits because, as I said, not only does this protect the hospital, puts it in a better legal position if problems arise further down the line, it also increases the likelihood of that doctor being offered things like counselling services. The last thing we could do if that doctor is going home for the day and isn't operating, we can try and liaise with their team to make sure that the nursing staff and the other doctors are aware that they've lost that consultant for the time being and offer to help as much as you can, at least helping them come up with a plan without sacrificing your own patients and taking on jobs that aren't yours. Your duty always needs to be to your own patients, but that doesn't mean that you can't help the team in what small ways you can. And as a final thing to think about, I wouldn't be offering at this stage to become personally involved with this doctor's case and their personal plight. I think a lot of candidates would be tempted to say, I can take them into a side room and to see what their deeply held worries are. That's not your place as an F1 doctor who doesn't know them very well. I think that's probably inappropriate, but you can at least signpost to support services that you think might be appropriate and hope that they try to engage with those services and get help, but it's not your business if they don't. You just have to let the hospital protocols take over. So that's where we're going to wrap, guys. Don't forget to go ahead and hit that like button, leave me a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out ollieburton.com for my full course of interview videos and more hints and tips just like these. Take care and I will see you next time.